I'm speaking with Amir El Safar, who. Uh, hey, everyone. So last week, I had the incredible opportunity to interview this guy, Amir El Safar. Amir is a composer and trumpeter, and he also plays the Santur, a zither like instrument, and sings Iraqi Makam, which is a repertoire of 56 traditional and somewhat esoteric compositions. Amir also leads this crazy large ensemble called Rivers of Sound. Yeah, it's, it is it is quite an undertaking and it, it is a big band or an orchestra. There's different ways of, of looking at it, but certainly a non-traditional one uh, at that because it's the types of instruments that are included. Um, while we do have drum set, piano, bass, and horns, there's also there's a violinist um, who also doubles on an instrument called the Joza, which is a spike fiddle. A cello player who's classically trained but also plays traditional Arabic music. Ouds, the lute of the Arab world, and buzuk, which is kind of a long neck steel string instrument from the Arab world. There's mridangam, which is the Carnatic two-headed drum, and then um, frame drums and, and other hand percussions. Not only that, but each of the musicians is pretty unique and has a very strong personality music and and also as as human beings this ensemble is extremely unusual like it's there isn't an ensemble in the world like it rivers of sound is about to embark on a tour of the united states which is an opportunity not to be missed so i'll provide a link in the description so that you can see if they're coming to your town and hopefully buy tickets to go hear them play by the way amir and i touched on T tons of topics in our interview and I didn't have time to cover nearly all of them in this short video but if you'd like to engage with that bonus material it's all available on my Patreon page. Now I don't know much at all about Middle Eastern music and I'm gonna reiterate that throughout this video but I am beginning to dip my toes into those incredibly beautiful waters because I'm currently surrounded by expert colleagues from various traditions in the band's visit. <laughs> As I've been learning about new modes, say, or rhythmic patterns or instruments from places like Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Israel, Iraq, etc., one thing becomes incredibly clear. As varied as the musical traditions that sprung out of Asia, Europe, and North Africa are, they are also, in so many ways, related. There are historical ties that sometimes we they're documented, sometimes not, of a musical language or musical tradition that started in one part of the world and through the expansion of an empire, like whether it's like the Babylonian Empire or whether it's the um, Sumerian or, or whether it's the Greek empires or the Islamic the Ottoman Empire, Empire. Ottoman yeah. empires, that these, you know, because of the freedom of movement in these large areas of the world, um, musical languages along with you know, goods and crafts and goods and crafts and goods and crafts and goods and crafts and a lot of other things, also religious traditions um, travel as well. So, um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it just takes one person. Very famous example is, is Ziryab, who was like um, competing with uh, Ishaq al Musali to be the court musician of Baghdad during the the height of the Abbasid Caliphate. So we're talking about, you know, 8th century uh, AD when, when Baghdad was this lavish, rich capital, kind of the, the, the center of the world, or at least the center of the Islamic world. And Ziryab was, was so talented that um, the person that he was about to supplant had a bounty out for his head and basically wanted to have him executed because he was, you know, he was too good. So he escaped and went to um, Andalusia, southern Spain, mm. and founded musical schools that still are practiced in North Africa, so like Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, um, and in some to some extent, um, Andalusia, they've left their mark in, in Cordoba, Seville, and mm. Granada. Um, but it's just, it's one human being. It, so it doesn't require an, a mass exodus of, of a whole population to bring a, a, a musical language. When I heard this story, I couldn't help but draw a parallel between Ziryab and Amir El Safar himself. 
Not that anyone has a bounty out on his head, although he is good enough to warrant that, but because he is on a seemingly one-man mission to bring Iraqi Maqam to a larger audience and prevent it from extinction. However, as dedicated as he is to tradition, Amir al-Safar is vehemently opposed to exclusionary or hierarchical musical practices. In fact, he formed the Rivers of Sound Ensemble specifically to bring together musicians from manifold backgrounds, cultures, trainings, and eras of music making. So in this video, I'm going to trace a line from Iraqi Maqam through microtonal performance practices in the Middle East and follow that thread all the way to the present day in Amir al safars original composition, Lightning Flash. This is Score Study with me, Brian Kroc. Part 1. What is Maqam? So this is a weird video for me because for the first time on this channel, I'm speaking about a topic that I know essentially nothing about. I'm speaking out of school on this one. And what's worse, it's about a topic that people devote their entire lives to studying exclusively. On top of that, there are tons of rules or better yet, customary expectations. And on top of all that, depending on the geographic region, there are subtly different intricacies. But in order to grow as musicians, it's of the utmost importance that we push ourselves outside our comfort zone regularly. At least I think that's the case. So I've recently taken a couple lessons with my friend Kane Mathis, an erudite gentleman who specializes in the oud, the kora, and dad jokes. Hey, man. You hear from the stash? Yeah, exactly. Right on, huh. Sorry. How much you need? <laughs> uh, I'll take it all. I'll take it all. How much? First one's on the house. <laughs> Also, on the recommendation of my colleagues, I've been checking out this website, macomworld.com, quite a bit. This is one of those delightful corners of the internet that reminds us that we can use our powers for good if we so choose. These guys have exhaustively compiled and neatly organized a ton of information. I particularly find the audio examples to be very useful. So before going any further, I need to make some distinctions because makam is one of those words that can have multiple meanings depending on who you're talking to. Let's start here. Makamworld.com says, the Arabic makam is a system of scales, habitual melodic phrases, modulation possibilities, ornamentation techniques, and aesthetic conventions that together form a rich melodic framework and artistic tradition. So yeah, that's broad. And it's important to remember that these things have have been codified retroactively. Like by listening to past masters, experts have slowly come up with a way to describe the system that they learned and passed on orally. But Iraqi makam is not this at all. In this context, makam refers to a genre of specific vocal settings of Iraqi poetry. The instrumentation usually includes santur, Amir's instrument, as well as the joza, which is a spike fiddle and is played by Amir's longest collaborator and sister, Dina El Safar, as well as cello, goblet drum, and sometimes oud, in addition to the key element of the vocalist, because it's vocal music. Like I said earlier, the genre consists of 56 compositions, and the only man alive who knows all of them also happens to be Amir's teacher and long-term collaborator, Hamid al-Sadi. Part two, characteristics of Arabic classical music. Okay, <laughs> how often do I need to reiterate that I am not an expert? Please, please, please remember that I am not an expert. 
Um, so in a little bit, Amir's going to talk us through my favorite composition from his newest record, which is called Lightning Flash. Since he's going to talk about the musical devices that he utilizes as a composer, and since a lot of those devices are somewhat foreign to most Westerners, I thought it would be useful and necessary to define some of the key characteristics of both Arabic classical music and also Amir al safars contemporary genreless hybrid music. Heterophony. Classical or traditional music from the Eastern Mediterranean countries is by and large heterophonic, which essentially means that all of the instruments involved play the same melodic line, but not necessarily in unison. Rather, each performer is free to ornament the music in their own personal manner, and this results in sort of blurry melodic lines that follow a strict trajectory, but aren't in unison in the way that we might expect to hear, for example, Western classical musicians play. This focus on melody also results in music that is largely devoid of chord progressions and often has no harmony at all. Microtonality. So one of the things that Kane Mathis explained to me that blew my mind is that because this music has no harmony, there's a need for additional tension and resolution in the melodic component, and that comes in the form of microtonal pitches. These pitches can be, but often aren't, quarter tones, which means a note directly in between the consecutive half steps of a piano. In fact, and again, I barely understand this myself, but in the Turkish system that Kane knows, they use the nine comma system. And a comma is a really small increment between two pitches. It's often just above what's technically called the just noticeable difference between pitches. So these are very, very small increments between notes. And the lower or flatter a pitch is, the more it's going to feel like it needs to resolve downwards. The higher or sharper a pitch is, the more it will feel like it needs to resolve upwards. And these are expressive devices. So uh, these pitches are dynamic in the sense that one note can have many different intonations the melodic m movements are mostly stepwise or maximum a third i mean they don't there's not big jumps and so it's sort of like your your gaze is much more focused on a, on a smaller area so like the distance of an octave is tremendous in maqam language and so and oftentimes we're dealing with just tetrachords like all a lot of melodic material will just happen within four notes and there's even some older recordings of Iraqi maqams I have where the singer doesn't, in the entire seven minutes, doesn't expand more than a fifth. Wow. But inside of that, there's so many subtle gradations of pitch that, I mean, yeah, we know what the basic mode is, but there's these little oscillations that are so precise that really just barely touch another note and you're not, I mean, and to transcribe it is almost impossible. You can only learn it kind of by okay. ear and internalize it. Whereas in, in you know, Western European music, you have this incredible, you know, basically the range of the piano with, between the, the, the contrabasses with their, you know, C extension yeah. and then the, the piccolo <laughs> yeah. flute. But the net result is kind of the same. It's just a question of your, of, of scale. Odd rhythmic groupings. In the West, we have this habitual phrase, odd time signatures. Know that this doesn't mean odd as opposed to even, but rather it means odd as in uncommon or unusual. But in in the Arabic world, grooves in 5, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, etc. are not at all uncommon. In fact, they're commonplace. Tetrachords. This word means exactly what it means in Western classical music. In Arabic music, pitches are organized into clusters of four or sometimes five consecutive pitches. So each tetrachord has a fundamental pitch, which a composer or improviser needs to establish as the main point of gravity before they're allowed to move to another related tetrachord. Did I mention that I'm not an expert in this? Okay, I think that covers everything we need to know for now, and I hope it's obvious that studying Arabic music uh, even just dipping your toes into the world like I'm doing right now will provide a creative musician with tons of inspiration and new ideas to explore and practice. Part three, lightning flash.
All musics utilize harmony, melody, and rhythm. We know this. But these categories are not always equal. In certain parts of the world, different corners of this triangle have grown exceptionally refined. And while I haven't researched this basically at all, I had a bit of a hypothesis that I wanted to run by Amir to see what he thought. In the Middle East, it seems that melody is so much more subtly refined. And I sort of have this metaphor in my head of, um, you know, how people say when you're missing one of your senses, um, your other senses develop to be um, more sensitive because of this sort of heterophonic nature of the traditions in that part of the world. The melodic component of the music has developed so subtly that the increments between pitches are microtonal, you know, that's an, ex an expressive tool that maybe supplants the need for having harmony or something. I also think about how rhythm in like the Caribbean or in Africa is so developed to a, such a crazy level, you know, in Western European music, certain people developed harmony to its uh, almost logical conclusion to the point of, mm. of being the 12 tone system or, or whatever. And that mm -hmm. became a, a very refined system of tension and release. And so um, what's really interesting to me about your music is that you're hearing all of these things. You're hearing microtonal melodic statements. You're hearing dense, sometimes very dissonant harmony, sometimes very beautiful harmony. You're hearing many different layers of rhythm at one time. Um, and these are things that aren't often juxtaposed. It's, mm. You know what I'm saying? So um, so it it can be almost an overwhelming um uh, or or like forbidding musical experience because <laughs> you're hearing so much complexity so if you've made it this far get mentally prepared buckle in we're about to dive into one of amir's original compositions for the rivers of sound ensemble and it's going to be work but the payoff will be great i promise so stick with me so i'll let amir take it over from here he first imagined legendary drummer nasheet waits playing an 11 beat cycle. This piece actually started with a, with a rhythmic idea. I was really thinking about Nasheed and this this phrase, which is like And then the, the, the bass would play the third triplet I often write my bass lines kind of turned around like the bass what sounds like the one is actually uh, an offbeat yeah and I, it's something that I've done for a long time and I don't know why but it's often the way I, I hear it and along with that came this har harmonic framework which is a, a bit based on something that, that would often come up in Cecil Taylor's music where you'll get these dyads where you get C, F, D, G, and F, B. Hmm. And it's this, this and he uses this a lot in his stuff and he also he often has these, this propelling triplet mo movement even though his music isn't metered but there's this triplet impulse to it. There were certain aspects of his um, melodic and harmonic language which are often overlooked because his acrobatics and his technique and his extended stuff he did on the piano are so impressive um his energy is just unparalleled but he had a beautiful kind of romantic um harmonic language that when he when he would teach it to us in the band you'd be, oh that is gorgeous and so in this case um i took that harmony like a similar kind of thing with these dyads cf dg and fb so it's kind of like a g7 sound um but using not a b natural but a b half flat mm -hmm. and um again on the recording you can hear how that sounds and to me this is like this is a dominant it's a g7 sound to me 100 percent mm -hmm. um even though it's this microtonal third but that third has become so natural to my understanding and my harmonic approach that that's like that's straight up g7 with a half flat third, which happens to be also the third that you hear in early blues recordings before, you know, things got tempered. Mm -hmm. 
And then da, 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 there's a big chord that comes in there. And it's almost all like it's kind of a stacked fourths, fourths and fifths. Um, that's like the first the first two bars. But then I come up with this. Phrase, which is kind of the the conclusion of this whole um, first twelve bars. It's kind of maqam. So F E A flat F D, and then uh, D C F sharp. That's not maqam, but it's it's a blues figure that's been stretched. Mm. The intervals have been equalized, or or the half plus whole becomes. Three quarter plus three quarter. Can I pl can I play? A, a please, play please, please, please. Yes, I would love that. If that phrase was equal tempered. Uh, And so everything is being stretched. I have to stop there for time. I'm sorry. You can hear Amir continue to analyze his composition in the bonus content on my Patreon page. Conclusion. Down with hierarchies. In preparation for my interview with Amir, I read an article that he contributed to the final installment of John Zorn's essential collection of essays by creative musicians, Arcana 10. In Amir's essay, he makes it clear that Rivers of Sound is emphatically not a multicultural fusion project, noting that these types of musical endeavors are often kind of lame because they are bogged down by essentialism or in Amir's words, indulging in romanticized ideals of other cultures. So as important as I think it is to understand the musical traditions that all the instrumentalists in Rivers of Sound are coming from, it is also essential to Amir for the audience to understand that each individual musician is not defined by where they're from, but rather is a complex individual with a multitude of ideas and influences to contribute. Even though I won't get the opportunity to experience Rivers of Sound playing on their upcoming tour, I hope that you do get to go hear them. Because Amir El Safar and his crew of world-class musicians are a musical embodiment of the possibilities that can become real when humans look beyond easy categorization, think about all the direct parallels in our society right now, and put in the effort and goodwill to appreciate each other as complex individuals that are all a part of the same tribe, namely humanity. Amir put it best when he wrote, As pitches and rhythms become fluid, so do boundaries. As elements that traditionally divide musicians and genre-specific modes are brought into new contexts. The idea is about fluidity. Sounds flow into one another, overtones interact, as we approach a universal human sound. 